So what we're going to do is discuss Lord of the Flies, and our discussion on this is not going to be as in depth as Heart of Darkness. With Lord of the Flies, we're going to focus primarily on the aspects of the novel. You read Jane Eyre, you read Frankenstein, Heart of Darkness, and now Lord of the Flies. All novels, this is the most recent. If you think about it from this perspective, Jane Eyre is going to be your 1800s novel, as is Frankenstein. Heart of Darkness bridges the gap between 1800 and 1900 by being 1900. This, 1950. It's the most recent, written in the wake of World War II. And the entire premise of this book is as follows. What is a fable? You probably heard the term with regard to Aesop, but what is a fable? Is Yes. At the center of a fable is a moral, I'm going to use the word nugget because I know that you all appreciate that word so much, a moral nugget. Lord of the Flies is a fable. We treat it as a novel, so we're going to look at its themes, its symbols, its characters, and whatnot. But we must also treat it as a fable. Now, when we've seen other fables, like for instance Animal Farm, Animal Farm is a fable, and what is the moral nugget at the center of Animal Farm? We had to boil it down. Communism. What? Communism is bad. Communism is bad. Yes and no. When in the wrong hands, certain aspects of communism do not quite work. It is also a novel about equality and how the very idea of equality is a flawed idea. Kind of like you see in the opening sentence of Harrison Bergeron, which is, oh, yeah. is the year 2081 and everybody was finally what does that mean? What is equality? And so it brings up those kind of ideas. At the center of Lord of the Flies is also a moral lesson. And what is that moral lesson? Okay, well, before you answer that, let's leave this as the question that we're going to arrive at in, in just a little bit. Let's put the pieces together first. To put pieces together, I want to give you some background information. And it starts with this book. Coral Island was a famous book that all British school children had to read. It was basically your version of Lord of the Flies. Everybody had to read Coral Island. It's not read anymore, because now people realize it was a pretty stupid book. But, back in the day, it was sort of like Treasure Island or Kidnapped, a Robert Louis Stevenson novel that everyone had to read, kind of like um, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. Why is it stupid? I'll tell you why and you'll, you'll come to that conclusion on your own when I give you a plot summary. It is a story about three boys, British schoolboys, who crash land on an island. Their names, Ralph, Jack, and Peterkin, who I don't really know where that name comes from, but Ralph, Jack, and Peterkin. So you're already thinking, uh, wait a minute, that's just like Lord of Flies. That's intentional. Ralph, Jack, Peterkin crash land on the island. Remember, though, they are British, which means they are the best at everything. Hmm. Which, remember, Ralph and Jack actually say in Lord of the Flies, we're the British, which means we're the best at everything. We're the best, we're the best. They maintain civilization. Yay! At one point in the novel, they are attacked by a group of savages, cannibals, people like that living on the island. What do they do, being good British boys? They actually save the cannibals and convert them to Christianity. Oh my god, how old are these kids? I know, that's exactly what I was thinking, symbolized that. the exact emotion that Hey, you get to the end and you're like, British really are the best at everything. It is what you might call terrible propaganda. propaganda. <laughs> now, this is what's read. This is what's read. This is what's read. Post World War II, Lord of the Flies is written. I don't tend to ascribe much to biographical information on the authors, but William Golding did write an article where he talked about writing Lord of the Flies, and in the article he even says. Don't take what I say at face value, but here are some thoughts about why I wrote it. And he says, after World War II, I realized there was some truth about humanity that had to be said. 
And it is that truth with, which answers this question. But in writing Lord of the Flies, he directly is referencing Coral Island. And here's how we know he's directly referencing it. In the book, it says it. Do you remember that at the very beginning? It is at the end, too. But at the very beginning, they say, no adults, no grown-ups, just a fun island, and they begin throwing around book titles. First it says, here was a coral island. Then, no, I wonder if I have it written down. I might not. Well, even if we can't find it there, the very last page, who shows up? A naval officer. The naval officer. The naval officer says, <clears throat> fun and games. And then he goes on to say, let's see, I should have thought that a pack of British boys would have been able to put on a better show than that. Jolly good show like the Coral Island. You are British boys. You need to be on your best behavior and be a representation of everyone else of the British Empire. So, there's a problem here. Which is, it's probably not the most realistic thing in the world. Three boys crash land on an island, probably not going to turn out the way that it does in Coral Island. So William Golding comes along and writes Lord of the Flies, where you have the same premise. A group of boys crash land on an island. What happens? Civilization, civilization, ah, terror, blood, mayhem, ah, madness, let's kill them, let's kill them, let's kill them. And it all ends with all of the hunters chasing Ralph down. I mean, this is one of the most intense endings we're going to find in, in the fiction we read in this class, which is they're running, they're chasing him down, they have a stick sharpened at both ends. For what purpose? You were to put his head on his head. Put his head on. Because the last time they did that, it was for the pig's head. Now it's for Ralph's head. We're reading this, we're like, oh man, this is insane, this is crazy, this is intense. And then, boom, they run smack dab into this naval officer. <coughs> and it says this, a little boy who wore the remains of an extraordinary black cap on his red hair, who carried the remains of a pair of spectacles at his waist, started forward, then changed his mind, and stood still. A little boy? Who is that? Jack. A little boy? No, he's an insane, deranged hunter. He's a maniac. He's crazy. I mean, he basically led everyone in a crazed ritual to dance around a fire chanting, kill the pig, cut her throat, spill her blood, which culminated in the entire pack of boys grabbing one of the boys, Simon, and ripping at him with their fingers and teeth until he was dead. A little boy? This is crazy. You get to the end of Lord of Flies, and you realize, shoot, and they're British. <laughs> I mean, you take the idea of, we're the best at everything. Look at how far they've fallen. And what do we realize is the central moral, the fable at the heart of Lord of the Flies? No. So but it's a good thing. It's the same as the heart of darkness. Same as heart of darkness, which is what? Man is, all of us have this in this. William Golding worded it like this, and I'll give you his direct quote. He said, Man produces blank as a bee produces honey. What word do you think goes in the blank? Evil. You're exactly right. Man produces evil as a bee produces honey. Now think about this for just a moment. A bee does not set out to produce honey. A bee sets out to pollinate. A byproduct of the pollination is the creation of honey. In this analogy, humans do not set out to create evil. Humans are not going to say, today I go about my evil works. ha 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 ha. No. Maybe some of us, but not all of us. No, it's a byproduct. What we do, the natural oozing element, is evil. The analogy is, is, is beautiful because the honey is sweet and lovely and satisfying and wonderful. Evil is not. We produce evil, bees produce honey. That's how it goes. We cannot help it. 
It's a byproduct of our natural, innate desires. He then goes on to say, these boys suffer the terrible disease of, here it is, being human. The terrible disease of being human. You imagine going to the doctor and the doctor says, what's wrong? I'm suffering. From what? A disease. What disease? Humanity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this visit is going to cost you $500. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you in here just to do that? <laughs> but, would it have been worth it? No! Oh, no! No! That imagine, costs more than your freaking picture frame. Imagine you've got your, yes, but you've got, you've got your iPhone set on video, and you're holding it like this. <laughs> hey, dog! You can do it with a sun so they can make it. Yeah, fine. Your nose is I'm bleeding and you throw up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm suffering from a. I just got a text from Mr. Ward. Just this now. video's completely messed up. <laughs> now, can you know, let me start over, Doc. Doc, hold on. I'm suffering from a disease. Can you FaceTime Mr. Ward? <laughs> yes! Oh, oh, please. Being human. Please. Can we actually. Human. Can we FaceTime Mr. Moore and act like no. it's an accident? Please. Just set it on the desk of one of us and How we'll, about we'll we talk about him. The fable. We talk about him like he's not here. Yes. And we insult him. Maybe something that he's right, confided right, in you. Right, right. I doubt he'll answer. That I doubt he will answer. He just texted you. He's clearly got you on the brain. Why are you still on Mr. Carter's teat? <laughs> what is it? Mr. Carter's boss. Why are you still on Mr. Carter's teat? How's it going? I'm sorry, you're trapped with Mr. Carter. In, uh, in July, in his classroom. It's gotta be brutal. It is. It sucks. He sucks. Still on Mr. Carter's teat? Yes. Yes, I mean, <laughs> 3 305, even in the summer. Okay. <laughs> That's very painful. <laughs> okay, now just. Mr. Uh, Moore, we are uh, we're talking about Lord of the Flies. Do you wish to uh, share your thoughts? Really? Uh, uh, I think the conch is symbolic in some way, but I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They have, well, they, they have finished it. They not know about it? <laughs> Is what? We're taping. We're taping you being FaceTimed. Excellent. I want this to be memorialized, immortalized for future 12 g suits. This will be on Vimeo for the next five days before my subscription expires. <laughs> but then I'm going to download it and upload it to YouTube for everyone to see. Well, Mr. Moore, we will let you go so that we can talk about the conch now that you brought that up. Okay, good. Thank you. Have fun. <laughs> Is it really pronounced conch? Yeah. Conch or conch? I thought it was conch. Yeah, either one. Is every it, year, it's it's every, really every, every year, my class erupts in debate over this. I've... Wait, some people are on the side of conch? I've yeah. never, I've never, heard, never heard, heard it conch. I've never heard. Have you never watched SpongeBob? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I've never heard. Heard. All hail the magic conch! Like all, they literally there's say. There's no all hail the magic conch. What is that? <laughs> what is that? In no <laughs> offense, that is a very popular pronunciation. It's, it's stupid. 
No, it, it comes from like um, is it not Caribbean the islands and stuff like that, where the conch shell is actually native to. So that's why. Thanks, Discovery Channel. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> the point is this. Okay, hey. No, 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 no. I'm looking this up. No, the point is this. No, the point is how it's pronounced. Fables, mm. in their moral message, bring about their moral message through uh, symbols and through anything that might mean something larger than itself, which is why the Blue Flies is littered with symbols throughout, from the beginning to the end. The story opens, in fact, at the very beginning, Ralph discovers the pristine island. The first thing that he does is get naked, which is obviously the first thing most of us would do. When he does that, it says he undoes the snake clasp of his belt. It then describes the entire beach in Eden-like terms, thus representing the following conclusion from that kind of symbolism. The boys land in paradise and revert to paradise. Therefore, what role does the environment play in the undoing of their humanity? Say, tree of knowledge is a huge. No role. So if we get that on the final exam, just leave that question blank. No, think about it from this perspective. What causes the boys to devolve into monsters? Each of themselves. Themselves. Something within themselves, the disease of being human. It's not the environment, because what is the environment? It's perfect. It's paradise. They have gone from civilization to the Garden of Eden. So you can't say that island caused them to go crazy. No. This is why it differs a little bit from what Marlowe would say in Heart of Darkness, where he would say, going to the uncivilized land brings out the hidden nature of humans. No. Because here's what Golding is suggesting. And this is one of the things he says in his essay. He says, look, I was with people, civilized European men, who did such atrocities and horrible things to each other that I couldn't even fathom the idea of continuing existence as a human afterwards. And this, these were civilized men, not the you know, savages you might encounter. So ultimately what's being said here is the symbolism is suggesting that something inside of the boys caused them to fall apart. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold symbols. Number one is the conch shell. What's another symbol? Something that resonates with its literal significance and then also a deeper meaning. Could Piggy's glasses be a symbol? Absolutely they could. What else? The pig's head. The pig's head, huge. And the flies. Um, Isn't that a subsection of the pig's head? Yeah. It's called the yes. Lord of the Flies. <clears throat> Lord of the Flies, what did the name derive from? Beelzebub. Beelzebub, which is a name for Satan or the devil. And so ultimately, Simon has a conversation with the pig's head. The pig's head is the Lord of the Flies, which is Beelzebub. But he says, don't you get it? I'm part of you. Who's Simon really talking to? Himself. Himself. The inner depravity within himself is telling him, I am part of you. Don't you see? Can't you see? The devil inside. Therein lies the morality lesson. Conch, the glasses, pig said, what else? Take a parachute? Absolutely. What do they believe that is? The beast. The beast at first. Here's one, and, and again, I'm taking a lot of what Bolton says about this, and I apologize, but I think because it's a fable, and he designed it as a tale for children, because he did, he wrote it for children. Because he designed it that way, I think it's fair to use his analysis of it. Well, he said that the parachutist was a symbol of dead history. The boys say, give us a sign, give us a sign, and there's an explosion in the sky. Plane blows up. Parachutist comes down. The saving human, the man coming to rescue them, it's dead. Can't do anything for them. If anything, it gives them something to fear. If he wrote it for kids, why did he put so much depth in it that he knew kids wouldn't get? 
I think when I say heroic for kids, I mean school-aged children. In our, in our terms, it would be 6th, 7th, 8th grade leadership. Same reason Lois Lowry does that with the giver. The giver is incredibly complex, intense, full of symbolism, rich in theme. We read it in sixth grade. We reread it at some point later on, and we're like, oh my gosh, can't believe all this was in there and I missed it. But as a, as a child, we focus on the story, we're engrossed in the story. It's even a little plot, it's an engrossing story. I mean, I know that you had to read it for class and it wasn't so much fun, but if you read it on your own, it's, it's awesome, so much fun to read. But then it's rich in human symbolism at the same time. That's kind of what makes it quality literature versus just a fun story. Take something like The Hunger Games, fun story, not quality literature, not rich in theme or symbolism or anything. You could analyze Hunger Games, and we did, as I told you, but it's not like Lord of the Flies. It's not going to last. Lord of the Flies is now required reading for everyone because it doubles as this moral fable, but also a work of literature that can be analyzed with regard to these aspects. If we just look at these core things, the glasses, what do the glasses do? What do they give us? Fire. fire. We talked about the significance of fire earlier with Frankenstein. What's the significance? Knowledge. Knowledge, power, everything encompassing fire. Who do we associate with fire in that classic story? Prometheus. Prometheus. Therefore, by association, who is our Prometheus in these boys? Piggy. Piggy. Piggy is the one who constantly brings the knowledge and the intelligence. Of course it's Piggy who has all the ideas and the thoughts. We need to build structures. We need to move the fire to a higher point. We need to do this. What do the boys constantly do to Piggy? They don't listen to him. They ignore him. Granted, he's super annoying, which is a problem. But why is that heavily symbolic that they ignore Piggy? What is Piggy? Glasses, fire, Prometheus, significance, what is he? Knowledge. He is knowledge. He is the insight. And so they don't want that. They despise that. And at one point, literally push it off a cliff. When Piggy dies, what is described as happening? Well, his head kind of explodes and stuff falls out. That's exactly what's described. Well done. Uh, it says this. And then his legs quiver like a pig. Um, I forget where it was. Um, well, 180 something? Or close to it? You're right. 181. Well done. It's very impressive. Um, it was on the quiz and I checked to see if I got the answer. That's the one you checked afterwards. Yeah. But you see, I, tur I turned the quiz over and put my pencil up there to make it very clear that everything was above board. That's fine. That's fine. All right. It says this. His head opened and stuff came out and turned red. His head explodes. It hits a rock and opens up. If you take the character who throughout the story represents knowledge and intelligence, of course that's going to be the part of him that's destroyed when he's killed. His head, his brain, his thoughts. What is simultaneously killed with Piggy? What does the conch represent? Any sense of authority and any sense of what? Civilization. Civilization or order. What's the initial rule of the conch? Everyone can speak about it. Whoever has it can talk, can speak. So the boys start with the premise of civilization. Let's organize, let's get names, let's get categories and groups, let's vote on a chief. Let's have a system of organization with the conch shell. Let's have fire with glasses. It all is so promising. And then it devolves and devolves and devolves. I, I keep doing this to you, and I apologize. I don't want you to feel like you're completely missing out. But one of the things we do in the year-long 12 ET class is we take a class period where I tell the students, I say, oh my gosh, you just crash landed on an island. Uh, unfortunately, you can't get off the island. You can't leave the island. There's no cell phone towers here. Um, good luck. And then I go sit at my desk and write down every single thing that they do for the next 20 to 30 minutes. One of two extremes happens. I've done this for seven years. Extreme number one, the students do nothing. Yeah. They sit in their desk, play on their phones, yep. put their heads down, go to sleep. Yeah. 
Extreme number two. Really loud. It gets crazy up in here. So you could have taken away all the funds and like this is the real Lizard Island experience. You could have given someone a sharpened stick and a dead pig. Yeah. Let me explain to you what happened this year. I went to sit behind the desk expecting the sort of like, I'm just going to sit there and do nothing. Immediate chaos. <laughs> the desks were turned over, forts were made, and someone began throwing books. <laughs> Maggie Mize jumped oh, up in the middle, and someone threw one of those green literature books <laughs> and hit her in the head. <laughs> Seriously, if we were really on a desert island, it would have been a lot. We would have organized, and I was just like, no. It would have been worse. <laughs> Someone would have died. Well, yeah, but I doubt it would have because anybody killed them. So here's, the, here's, the, here's our, our larger I point, is the conch shell and its representation and the glasses, all of these things come together to show you how ultimately the story suggests that something inside of themselves that they cannot control spirals out of control, and that something inside of himself is represented by the pig's head, which, by the way, Ralph, when he encounters, hits trying to destroy because he doesn't like what it represents, and what happens when he hits it? <coughs> Small minor point in all the men are Yes. It breaks, oh, and the yeah. grin falls into two pieces six feet across, and it's now smiling up to the sky, the same smile on the beheaded faces of the ornamental <coughs> things placed in front of Kurtz's compound. They were smiling. There's always a smile. And there it is, smiling up at the sky, aware of the deeper significance. There's a final symbol in this book that bears weight, and it is the, um, how, how do they describe it? It's the boat, the trim cruiser in the distance. I'll just put trim cruiser. The naval officer shows up to save the day, to rescue the boys from their fun and games. He's shocked by their display, shocked by the fact that boys have been killed. He takes them onto the cruiser under the guise of rescue. Why is it a guise, given the symbolic significance of the vessel that is rescuing them? Because it's only taking them back into the world of war. Precisely. If you think about the very principle of the British Navy at this point, it was to seek and destroy, wherein the British Navy ships would surround the enemy vessel, driving that enemy vessel to a certain point to destroy it, just like what? Just like they did with Ralph in the hunting. They drive to the furthest extreme to destroy. The boys are not being rescued. They're being taken into a larger scale war under the Allure or illusion of civilization. It's civilized war. Is it? Because you're still killing people, just on a larger scale. Well, you're not fighting them and tearing them with your fingers. You aren't. Yeah, but they were also using mustard gas yeah. and other things that are considered war crimes, so I don't think it's a lot better. It's a fable, and its ultimate meaning and message lingers long after the book is read, which I think makes it a success. Speaking of success, speaking of your success, your enjoyment of the class and whatnot, I thought it best if we end this entire 12 ET class with an in-class essay. I was hoping you were going to say 30 minutes per week. You're yeah. a piece of trash. You are the pizza burn on the world's mouth. Stop. <laughs> you are. I like that. You are the opposite of Stop that. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs>